x in algebra 2, lesson 80. Direct and inverse variations as ratios. Whoa, doesn't that sound so interesting and fun? You guys, just be so excited because this is going to be a really fun lesson. Let's start with a chart. I mean, charts are always fun, right? I get excited when I draw them. When I was in grade school, especially first grade, I remember, my teacher had this thing where she was always having us take pieces of paper and fold them into different numbers of columns and rows because then it would make like grids on our papers and we'd write different things in them. She was really into that and I thought that was the freaking coolest thing ever to be able to organize your paper. Like she might have us divide it, divide it into nine and then write a different word in each one. She had her reasons was to try to make us neat. Um, but I was really into it. Now I just draw crooked charts, you know, sorry, Mrs. Newhart. Um, okay. Here's how I want it to look. Three columns, but you can make the first one a little bit more narrow and then there will be Make three rows, and the first one can be a little bit more narrow. All right. Direct. Inverse. Constant. And ratio. Okay. When we first started talking about direct and inverse vari variations, I gave you a ratio that looked like this. We said um, the amount of A varies directly with the amount of B. And we would change the story, right? The, the amount of toys on the floor um, varies directly with the number of toddlers in the room. I think that was the example I used. That's one of my favorites, right? And then inverse, we would say like this, the amount of candy left in the bowl is inversely related to the number of dads who are helping themselves to refreshments, right? Or I think I've done uh, the number of pizza slices left in the box is inversely related to the number of teenage boys, right? Okay, so we have direct variations and inverse variations, and we had this constant called K, and what we would do is we would get enough information so that we'd use the first step of solving for K, and then we would use K in the second step to answer a question. So those were two step problems. Now what we're gonna learn is that we can take the same information and get the same answer by creating ratios. And you'll see how we use this. The nice thing about the ratio method is that we don't have to solve for a constant and then do it as a two-step. We can plug all the numbers in at once and solve. Okay, so this is what the ratio for a direct variation looks like. Notice it's A1 over A2 equals B1 over B2. And the inverse ratio formula is A1 over A2. Ready? Wait for it. B2 over B1. What? It goes upside down. All right. So copy this. What I suggest you do for this one is don't copy it now, but when you sit down and get ready to do your homework, recopy this into your binder cover, your notebook cover, so that it'll be fresh in your mind when you get ready to do the problems. Please do that. Please. Please, won't you? It'll be fun. Okay. Let's use these in an example so you can see what I, I'm talking about. A varies directly as B. Okay, that puts us in this column. If A is 50, when B is five, what is the value of A when B is seven? Okay, there's no story. There's no dads eating pizza. There's no toy toddlers throwing toys on the ground. So it's just pure numbers. And they don't really tell us A1, A2, B1, B2. We have to figure that out. What they do, John, not they, tells us very clearly is that these two numbers go together and these two numbers go together. When If A is 50, when B is five. 
So these two we know are together. What is the value of A when B is seven? So these two go together. So here's the thing. As long as you make these guys the same number and these guys the same number, it'll work out. Logic to me says make this A1 and B1 and this A2 and B2. You could reverse the numbers and it would still work. But if you made this A1 and this B2 and this A2 and that B1, you would screw up the problem and get it wrong and be mad. All right? So we're going to use the ones and twos just to keep them in order. And we're going to set up the ratio and we're going to solve. Are you ready? 50 over 5 equals, we'll call that X. I'm not going to write A2. Wait. Oh, I'm sorry. I did that wrong. I'm sorry. 50 over X equals, we're going to call that X, equals 5 over 7. This would have worked out, but it would have been confusing because I wasn't using the formula properly. So pay no heed. Ignore that. All right. That is the way we are going to solve this lovely problem. Now, the irony, of course, is that even though it's not a two-step problem, it takes a couple more steps to solve it, but that's okay. So we're going to get 50 times 7 equals 5x. My advice is do not multiply that yet. Get the third number over there, then see what you can cancel. You see what I mean? I could have multiplied that up to 350, but then I would have had to sit here and try to figure out how many fives go into 350, which wouldn't have been the worst, but five into 50 is a lot easier. I know that's 10. And so I know that X equals 10 times seven, 70. Which some students might say, well, that was obvious because look, 50 and five, seven, it would be 70. But the numbers won't always be easy. So just use the formula. Okay. So far, so good, right? Let's do another one. Let's squeeze it right here. 80.2. Cost varies directly as the number purchased. Okay, so cost varies directly as the number purchased. I'm going to write this as C1 over C2. Cost over cost equals number over number. And then I'm going to read the information. Ready? If 12 can be purchased for $78. Okay, 12 must be the number, and 78 is the cost. How much would 42 cost? So that's the number, and the cost is what we're trying to figure out. So we'll call these two the ones. And these the twos. Those numbers are tiny. You probably can barely see them. You're pressing your noses up to your screens right now and getting little smudge marks on them. All right. This was the way I wrote my formula. I've got everything labeled based on what John said. So now I'm going to fill in. C1 is 78. C2, we don't know. I'll use C2 this time instead of X. N1 is 12. And N2 is 42. Do you like it? I do. All right, we cross multiply. And again, I'm not gonna multiply anything until I get all the numbers together. 78 times 42 equals 12 times C2. I divide by 12. Okay, what can we do to simplify here? Well, I can take six out of both of these, right? 6 out of 12 leaves me 2. 6 out of 42 leaves me with 7. And then I can take the 2 against the 78. That would be 39. And the 2 turns into a 1, so I know I'm done. 39 times 7 is going to give me my answer. 63. 21 plus 6. So the amount, C2, equals 273, and that's a cost, so I'm going to put a dollar sign on it. And there's my answer. And you can put it in your chart if you want. Bonus points for being organized. All right, cool, right? This is a very simple and straightforward 
easy to remember. Um, now we're going to try a couple problems, just one, with the inverse ratio method, and then we shall be done. Ready? 80.3. All right, and remember our basic form here is A1 over A2 equals B2 over B1. Inverse in the name of the problem, inverse in the formula of the problem. It makes perfect sense, right? Okay, blues vary inversely as yellows squared. Oh, so let's fix this so it's um, blues and yellows. Blues... Very inversely as yellows squared. So that is trippy because look, we have to put a square up here, but then we also have the subscript. <gasps> so many details for us to go crazy. This represents a mathematical procedure. This just helps us key into the story. All right, if 100 blues go with two yellows, how many blues go with 10 yellows? Okay, so again, the words make it very clear that these are the two sets. We'll call this the ones and this the twos. We don't square them over here, we square them when we put them into the formula. So this will be, we'll write it right here, B1 is 100 over B2, we don't know, that's our mystery. That equals Y2 goes on the top and we want it squared, so I'll write it like this, over and Y1 squared goes on the bottom. And we square that. Cute, right? Um, not hard, you just have to keep your wits about you. And if your brain is operating on maximum efficiency, you can see this is gonna be really easy to solve. Let's go ahead and just blow out those squares. We get 100 over B, not squared, but B2 equals 100 over four. I am going to cross multiply those, but it's really easy to see that. Well, I could cross multiply those and solve it like we have, but look, Obviously, B over B2 equals 4. And that's the correct answer. 100 over B2 equals 100 over 4. Well, these are exactly the same, so obviously B2 is equal to 4. We could cross multiply and go through that whole rigmarole, but we would get the same answer. All right, so I don't know how you feel about it, but in some ways I really like this ratio method. It seems a little direct, um, a little more direct, a little to the point. We don't have this random K floating around. I like this because I find this, I mean, this isn't hard to memorize, but this is really easy for me to remember. The A's and the B's, and then you just flip the B's. All right, so have some fun with that lesson 80, and I will catch you on the other side.